been a while since you've been on the show, so I figure we'll go ahead and introduce you again and yeah. have you tell tell a little bit about yourself and how you got your start and where you came from and all that kind of stuff, man. So uh, go ahead and hop to it there, brother. Okay. Yeah, my uh, my name is Richard, and uh, actually I came to the industry uh, as a truck driver, actually, um, back in 2012. From there, I uh, kind of moved through the, the ranks probably probably pretty faster than, faster than I should have, but I uh, went into a lease operator and then became an owner-operator, uh, came off the road, and uh, did a little bit of local um, aspect of it, a few, you know, flatbed and Amazon, so on and so forth, and then moved into uh, being a, a broker with Integrity Express back in 2017, and then from there, uh, came uh, got away from them back in 2020 and been an independent freight agent since, and currently am. Good deal. Good deal. All right. And uh, I know we've been talking about the market. We've been talking about different things going on within the market. And a lot that seems to be the topic of discussion across the across the industry out here. And I'm sure as well, mm -hmm. even in, in even in your circle there. But, uh, you know, do you see a crash coming or do you see a market? Is this just a market correction? I, what, I, what are you, yeah, what I are you seeing on your end? I I, be, I believe that uh I don't know that I if if it does crash I wouldn't be surprised but I I'm leaning more towards the data and some of the things that I'm seeing is more of a correction. Um, there's numerous different factors going on. I mean, one is obviously coming out of uh, the whole COVID ordeal. Everything the way it's done has completely changed. It's not any more based on you know these customers and these stores and stuff like that. Uh, order and based off projection. You know, ever, prior to that, they used to. It was it was pretty easy. Um, it was always very consistent. The patterns were always there. These you know these companies knew. Okay, we we need to order X amount of so and so product. You know, for the next uh, for January or February because this is what we predict. They they can't they can't necessarily do that now because uh, everything's different. You know, people are spending money differently, so on and so forth. And and the data is just not the same. So a lot of these stores. Um, at this point, are not able, are not able to predict like they used to at one point in time. So you have that to take in consideration. Uh, two, you know the whole supply chain chaos, you know ordeal that we've seen uh, that brought, that was brought on with COVID as well, and you know some of those things we still are seeing as far as food and so on and so forth. Inflation is is a big part of it that causes the price of everything to go up. So these these customers, a lot of these customers, are not willing to. Um, do the same thing that they once were willing to do before. Now, the cost effect aspect of it has to really be at the forefront of them being able to decide, okay, we're going to move forward with, you know, placing these many orders or uh, the cost is a little too much. We're not going to be so, uh, you know, so, so uh, open-minded on placing those many orders or that many volume. We need to scale it back a little bit and just purchase just enough of what we need See what it does. See what the data produces, and then that determines with uh, you know how much how, how much flexibility we're willing to take on the next order. And you're seeing a lot of that now. So I think that's another massive ordeal that leads to why in a lot of places throughout the United States, especially on a drive-in and refrigerated aspect of it, you're seeing uh, a lot more of a supply. You know, meaning more trucks than there are uh, loads that you know are available, and obviously it leads to the prices you know being affected by it and all that. But yes, I do. I don't see it necessarily completely crashing out. I do see it correcting itself, and uh, the way of the consumer spending money is changing as well, which is a massive reason why we're seeing the correction of what we're seeing. Right, which seems to be affecting through our box and reefer for the most part, mm -hmm. from what you're yep. seeing on your numbers. Now, yep. comparing today, like your your lanes that you've been running today that you were running a year ago, what's what's the price difference in, say, Cali to Pennsylvania or, or something like that from today as compared to a year ago? Uh, so I have, I'm not running uh, California to Pennsylvania at the moment. So I don't want to sit here mm -hmm. and tell you off the top of my head. And I know, it's, I, I know what I saw on that the other day of what was being offered. And I, I don't know for sure if that's the going price. But I, I, because I saw so many posting it for the same price, I would imagine it has to be somewhere in that ballpark. But I was seeing a lot of California to uh, you know Pennsylvania for – um, right around eight thousand, 
Uh, 8,200 seems to be about roughly what I was seeing on, you know, one pick, one drop. Obviously, you throw in more picks and all that other stuff in the other that, you know, also affects the price. But uh, on one pick, one drop, I was seeing about, you know, that 8,000 ballpark figure to be to seem to be what everybody was trying to get it moved for, for the most part. Um, but when you take in consideration that same lane of California to PA, uh, you know, one pick, one drop last year, roughly, you know, the same time last year, beginning of June wise. Now we obviously know California traditionally, uh, for the most part is, is tight in June, but, or in, in definitely leading up to June, it tends to tighten up a little bit more. We're not seeing some of that same exact behavior. We're not seeing some of those things take place at the moment. Not that it won't. It's just by now we kind of seen it tighten it up little by little. And every year it seems to be where you can kind of say, okay, we know for May going into June, it seems to tighten. We're not seeing some of that same stuff. So that's where you're seeing, uh, you know, last year that price could have very well on that lane. It wasn't unheard of to be 9,000, 9,500 or anything like that. So though you can, you can probably see a good, Eight hundred, a thousand dollar difference minimum, if not more, depending on on what the requirements of the particular load itself is. Right, right. So it it seems to drop anywhere between eight hundred and a grand as compared to the same time last year. Correct. So yeah. Do you think these brokers are keeping the money, or do you think it's a uh, are the customers still allowing brokers to bid it on long term contracts? Or is it short-term contracts and brokers are not really making out as great as some of these drivers think they are? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's there's some brokers out there that are tied into some long-term contracts, so to speak, and they're definitely dependent on the areas that they're running out of or, or reaping uh, as far as the benefit of, of making a few extra hundred bucks than, than common. Sometimes more than that. You obviously, you know, and everything, you have your goods and bads. Uh, so there's some brokers out there that are without a doubt taking advantage of it. But on a bigger scale, on the bigger picture aspect of it, it is not like a lot of folks like to believe it is. They, they, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that like to believe that, you know, majority of these brokers or all of these brokers for the most part are just out here, you know, raping it up and, you know, uh, making, you know, the profit margin that they're making off one load is enough to pay their, their you know, their, their mortgage for the month. No, that's not the case. These customers are not dumb. These customers did not become who they are and did not become valued at what they're currently valued at by just being willing to pay whatever it is that you tell them is the cost to move your product from point A to point B. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the biggest thing in business, obviously, is cost. And the cost is something that's scrutinized and looked at every single time, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, you know, and it's something that we should all be doing. Owner, operators, brokers, everybody, you run a business, you should always be scrutinizing your costs and looking at everything and making sure that, you know, uh, what it is that you're paying compared to what you're getting and so on and so forth is, you know, is adding up and it makes sense. And they're doing the same thing, you know, whether it's Walmart or any of these big companies out here or, or your smaller shippers, they're all doing the same thing. They're all sitting back looking at their costs and saying, okay, th what is it going to take for us to get what it is that we're looking for? Um, and what are the things that we can do to minimize the cost, uh, in a sense, so we're able to stay in business. Same thing that a lot of the owner operators are doing right now with obviously the price and dropping what it is. And then obviously the fuel prices that we have going on and the cost of being there, you know, you have to look at what it is that you can do to minimize the cost on that aspect of it. So obviously you can remain profitable. And so you have to be willing to adapt and find those lanes that are, you know, profitable for you and so on and so forth that, that makes sense for you. And they're doing the same thing. So these you know, used to be custom, these customers who at one point in time, they all for the most part used to lock in the one year contracts or even two year contracts in certain instances, because it was going to be pretty easy to be able to tell what the market was doing. And for the most part, it worked. You don't see that no more. That was tr the traditional way of doing things. A lot of these customers, believe it or not, are not really focusing on doing any of those long term RFPs, because they know they're not going to matter. They're not going to stand. So when you look at what's going on, the prices that has been been paid since the beginning of COVID, and now finally things seem to be loosening up a little bit, and the demand is without a doubt dropping, and we've seen that over the last few months, these customers are starting to go back and say, okay, well, one of the things that we've learned is that long-term RFPs don't work. We're going to have to lower that down, and we're going to have to look at it at more of a short term, and whatever it is that makes short sense for them is exactly what they're doing. Some of them may lower it down to six months. Others are lowering it down to 30 days. Some or even doing it on a weekly basis because it is what it is. And there is more work with that, but the reality is 
when you're looking at a company doing like what I just mentioned not too long ago, that they're looking at their costs and they're scrutinizing and making changes wherever it is so they remain profitable, that is the way for them to do that, is to lower the, the you know, to make those RFPs or whatever the case may be on a sh more short-term basis so they can be able to control the costs more and make sure that they're not just overtly expending, uh, you know, spending more than what they have to, but still making sure that they're getting the service they're getting. And so, yes, it is. Those long-term RFPs are not happening or anything like that anymore to the to the extent like they used to at one point in time because of that being a massive aspect of it. So, and every time when the market changes like it is now, the brokers are effective as well. Just like, the, you know, just like we have in a lot of areas more trucks than there are loads. And so really all those trucks, however many trucks may be in that given area are all technically competitors of one another when it's all said and done at the end of the day. Same thing with brokers. You know, the, the brokers are all competitors of one another. It's about, you know, who, who can service the customer properly, who is the one that knows what they're doing, who's the one that's always available uh, and has effective communication and is able to effectively not only communicate with the driver, but communicate with the customer as well. Because at the end of the day, you're the middleman to be able to bring it together in a sense and, and try to get that load from point A to point B in a safely manner and trying to make it a win-win for everybody involved. And that's a lot, a lot harder said than done, to be honest with you, <laughs> a lot of times. But yeah. it doesn't matter. You should always be aiming that way anyways. I saw uh, some statistics on 2021, and there were more brokerages opened up in 2021 than in the previous five years. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Same thing, same thing with the uh, uh, authority. Yeah, with authorities as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's definitely been an influx of brokers. Plus, you got a lot of brokers now that are working from overseas. I don't know if yeah. you saw the Asian Maya show he put out about a, a little scam they got going on with Amazon Prime. And stealing trailers, a lot of that's from overseas brokerages in the Ukraine mm -hmm. and, and elsewhere. So mm -hmm. this price drop's not just hurting the the drivers; it's also hurting you, the broker, as well. Your the amount of money you're making on on your end. Oh yeah, yeah. You have to you have to change your as a broker, uh, as any business for that matter, but but definitely as a broker perspective, you have to you have to change. You have to be willing to adapt and a change of what it is that's truly important. Uh, for some brokers, it may be, you know, and, and there's really no right or wrong answer because everybody runs their business slightly different. Um, you know, obviously some folks, they, they're focused more on how much money they can make, and that's all they care about at the end of the day. Um, other folks are, are focused more on the relationship aspect of it. Yes, they're going to make money. they got to make a living. Obviously, there's costs associated with it, so, I mean, it is what it is, but they're focused more on the relationship aspect of it. At, you know, whichever one it is that they choose to go and how they choose, you know, what structure it is that is that their business is going to be run upon is, is up to them. But at the end of the day, I will say this, that when you see the market shift in a downward trend like it has, just like, well, just like it would, you know, in the opposite direction, and if it, tr you know, trend upward, like we saw at the beginning of the COVID aspect of it. But when you see trend downward like it is, you have to go back and change and look and be willing to adapt and determine what it is that's important for you. What can you what is it that you have to adhere to to be able to stay in business, um, and and what do you don't? So, for an example, when the market's great, you know you might decide to say, hey, you know what? On every single load I do, um, I'm going to really aim for that 13 to 15 percent or 13 to 17 percent, whatever it is that you're looking for, and that's what you're going to aim for. That's what you're going to focus on. That's you know you're going to hold to it as much as possible, and you're not going to deviate from it. And that's sure, the profit the that lot, you as that's the profit that you as a broker are trying to make on that load, 13% or Correct. 18%. Correct. Okay. Yep. So, and, uh, and, and so, and you may have some brokers that may decide to, you know, go about it doing it that way, and that's it. That's what they're going to adhere to. They're not going to really deviate or get away from it. And if the market allows them to do that, they can do exactly that and remain very successful with it. Um, you know, myself, I have to make a living. But me personally, I tend to look at it more of a relational aspect of it. Um, I, I do strongly believe that, you know, as long as you do what you're supposed to do and you take care of your customers and try to take care of everybody involved, sure, you know, you're not going to win every single one of them, so to speak, if you're looking at a transactional aspect of it. But in the long run, uh, you're really starting to establish the foundation that you need to establish there for you to be able to longevity wise be doing business with that customer down the road, 5, 10, 15, 20 years and establishing that relationship, um, you know, in that aspect of it. And so then I have to look at it and say, okay. In a market like today, where everything's downward trends, do I really want to focus on saying that I must make 15, 16% and that's it? If that's what you want to do, sure, you can still do that, but you have to understand that by you doing that, you're increasing the ability of another broker being able to come in 
and undercut you and gaining that business, and then now you're not having that business. Right. So, you know, right. you have to decide what it is that you really want to, you know, you really want to abide by. And, and if you're okay with understanding that there may be, you know, oh, I, I have a few customers and they're not going to do that, whatever the case may be, look, man. The reality is at the end of the day, business is business. And like I said earlier, it's about the cost of you getting what it is that you're looking for. There's not, co there's no customers, you know, there's not very many customers in a sense out here that are just like, you know what, we know we're purposely paying $2,500 more, but we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't happen as much as we would like to believe it does. They're they're right. watching the cost just like we're watching the cost. They're doing the same thing on their end because, believe me, if they go over that threshold, if they go over the whatever that cost is that has been established, you know, by that company, whether it be on a quarterly basis or semi-annually or whatever the case may be, they're going to be out of a job, especially right. if they're a publicly traded company. That Whoever that person is is out of a job. They're moving on. They're going to go find somebody else. And that applies Correct. the same across the board, and that's why we always have to be willing to be to be able to adapt and look at things and understand it the way it's meant to be understood, because that you know that's how we stay in business. Now, earlier you mentioned the fuel price. Obviously, the fuel price has gone up. Cost of doing business has gone up. We know that the mm -hmm. fuel price affects the fuel surcharge, but how much does the fuel price actually affect the rate, the line haul rate? Does it at all? No, not really. I mean, you know. The reality is, so line haul is, is practically exactly that, just a line haul. And that's where the fuel surcharge comes in. And the fuel surcharge was actually, you know, implemented way back in the days to, just to help with offsetting the cost of fuel. Uh, nowhere in there does it say that the fuel surcharge is to completely cover the cost of fuel. And I think that's where a lot of folks are are getting a mistaken that, you know, you have a lot of these folks out here. I've seen a lot of posts where, oh, well, you know, if uh, – if, if if the fuel if the fuel price is six dollars per gallon, then uh, I'm not moving my truck unless I'm making six dollars per mile. Well, that's right. very funny. You're not going to be moving the truck at all then, <laughs> because <laughs> you know the reality is is that you know um, you know that doesn't that the the, the six dollars a gallon ha does not transform over to first of all that that's actually your true cost. You have to break it down and understand what your cost per mile is. And then being able to uh, make sure that your accounting, whatever that cost of fuel is, is put into your overall cost per mile. So, yes, did the cost per mile go up for truck drivers? Oh, absolutely. The price of fuel is up. So the cost per mile aspect of it has gone up. But as far as that cost being attributed to the line haul portion of a load, no. It's attributed to the fuel surcharge portion of a load. And fuel surcharge is, is you know, some companies don't pay. Some companies don't say, okay, charge me this much per line haul, and this is what it is with the fuel surcharge. Yes, there's companies out there that do it that way, but not every company is structured and conducts business like that. There are a lot of companies out there with, that will do an all-in rate with everything included, and that's it. Right. Because every time they got to break it down, the more line items that is broken down, so on and so forth, the more work that's created, the, 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 more, you know, the, more, the more manpower that is needed to make sure that those things are being processed correctly, and the higher increases of there being mistakes when it comes to the invoicing aspect of it. That's, that's the truth. And a lot of those companies don't want to deal with that. They just want to do an all risk, move on. We keep it moving. So are you seeing more of the customers wanting to do all in rates since the fuel's up pretty high or it's still remaining about the same? I, I think it just really comes down to the overall structure of what it is that they go based off of when it comes to their transportation. Uh, if they're still, if they're still based on working whatever with whatever carrier base it is that they're working with for a certain long you know period of time, so if they're involved with uh, you know like for an example, I had a customer that I did a bid on a pretty large bid on uh, back in March, so a few months back, and uh, I didn't win anything with them, but it wasn't necessarily because my rates were ridiculous. I I kind of already understood, uh, being that I've worked with that customer before, that if you're not already inside, you know, excuse me, as far as actively set up with them and doing business. Um, they weren't they weren't really in a position where they cared to do many, you know, where they cared to make many changes. And, and that's the reality. You know, if they feel confident, if they feel comfortable with the carrier base that they already have and the system that they already have in place and it's effective and it's meeting the numbers and hitting the quotas that they're looking for, then, of course, they're not going to be necessarily so much inclined to want to make any massive changes to that carrier base because, well, if it's going good, it's going good. Why change it? Um, and so, you know, I think that they did – the, the RFP, you know, the bid process more to gain an understanding, a little bit insight of what people predicted the future to do. 
Uh, but that's a little hard to do because for you to know exactly at this point what to predict, you know, six months, 12 months down the road, sure, we can look at the data, we can predict this, we can predict that, but at the end of the day, there's really no way of 100% knowing truly what the cost is going to be six months or 12 months down the road. First of all, you have to start learning, you know, you have to start learning what the supply and demand is going to be in, in that time period. What is it going right. to change? Is it going to be worse then than it is now? Is it going to be, you know, so there's so many different aspects that goes into it. And a lot of times they look at, you know, the future of the orders and so on and so forth to kind of gain that understanding, to get the gain that ice, that insight of what to predict in. But I don't know that that data is out there just yet for someone to feel comfortable in what to predict. And that's why we see a lot of the customers not order like they used to before. Well, so, I saw that uh, China reported that their logistics is operating at 20% capacity. Plus, we have the war, obviously, dragging on in the Ukraine, which has been dragging on a few months now. How much is mm -hmm. that affecting our freight here in the United States? And is that a part of what's causing the uh, drop in the, in the amount of freight we have coming in? Um, well, I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much I, I – I couldn't sit here and tell you that I know for sure, as far as percentage-wise – how much the war with Ukraine is uh, affecting our supply chain aspect of it here in the United States on a domestic aspect of it. Um, I, I will say, I will say that uh, over the years, especially over the last few years, for sure, there has been, and you kind of touched based on it earlier with, uh, you know, there's been a lot of companies overseas uh, that are operating and doing business in the United States, but obviously being domiciled uh, over in places like Ukraine, uh, India, stuff like that, you know, some of the countries, I'm sure there's many other countries as well. Um, and I'm not going to mention no name, but there was a, a huge, huge company uh, that hired a lot, a lot of owner operators um, uh, way back about a few months ago that was talking about how much their overall business was affected monetary-wise because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, they had a lot of business dealings, a lot of office, a lot of folks in general that were doing a lot of uh, overseas business for this company out of Ukraine. And obviously, when that war kicked off at the end there in February, uh, it, it you know threw a huge monkey wrench into it, also into it, and cost them a lot of money. So mm -hmm. there are definitely companies out there that are pushing their operations and are uh, starting to implement and rely a little bit more on overseas, you know, companies and, you know, uh, people and so on and so forth because of the fact of lowering the cost as far as labor and all that compared to trying to hire someone to do the same thing here in the United States. And so, um, yeah, those, those are, those, there's, we're definitely starting to see a lot more of that. I mean, we have people down in Central America that are doing uh, business here in the United States and so on and so forth, but, you know, obviously they're doing it from down there. So we're starting to see a lot of more of that. And, again, it just relates back to, uh, the cost factor of it. Okay, what what can we get out of this? What do we get? You know, how much right. are we spending compared to the productivity that we're getting? And the reality is, is that in a lot of instances, there people, folks are paying less and and are gaining a lot more productivity than they were when they were paying more. And that's that's a, that's the reality in a lot of ways. Right, right. Now, do you see this uh, turning around? Maybe later this year. Maybe the rates coming up. Do you see it continuing to fall, or do you see it leveling out about where it's at now, or what do you think? I think it's, well, you know, because we know it, it ties into the overall economy. You know what I'm saying? And we know that everything's based off of, uh, you know, the, 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 how, how investors and people feel uh, as far as the economy doing. The more they, they feel, the, the, more, the more trust there is in the economy, the more that folks are a little more willing and flexible on going out to spend money. Um, when you look at the inflation, the inflation is where it's at, you know, folks are being a little more careful about what it is they're spending money on. They're not just that, you know, a lot of folks are not really out there spending money like they used to at one point in time. They're, they're, they're starting to look at their money and realize, wait a minute, uh, it, it's costing more for us to live with the basic necessity of things than what we paid before. So we have to be a little more careful about that and make sure that we're taking all that in consideration. And of course, that leads to folks not going out and spending money as, as, as at one point in time, like they, you know, right now as they used to at one point in time. So that's going to lead to overall the consumer aspect of it. You know, that's going to lead overall to the customers and what it is that they're doing and what they're ordering and projecting and so on and so forth. So the inflation in the economy plays a huge point into what the future holds for the supply chain aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. Because, the, you know, we have to start getting the economy going back in the right direction. Try to figure I'm out a way. I'm hoping midterms. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping midterms. We definitely need that. Yep. 
and, uh, and, I, and, and, if, and if we start getting the economy to start, you know, positioning itself to getting back on the right path, then hopefully we can, you know, the inflation follows with it as far as slowing down. Um, you know, obviously we know it's not going to go back to what it used to be, but if we can slow that inflation down without a doubt, which it will, it, it, it automatically will slow itself down when the economy starts going better, getting into that right path. And when you start seeing that shift take place, I think you're going to start seeing consumers little by little once it happens and the more that it starts taking off and gaining traction and the economy starts doing, you're going to see people willing to spend more money and so on and so forth. And that's going to start kicking a need up for more orders and more volume, which is going to equal out to the supply chain aspect of it. Correct. Correct. So that, that'd be what would bring it back. You know, something I always yeah. wonder, it's a little little bit off topic, but, you know, companies like TQL and C.H. Robinson who – Traditionally, what do they want out of their broker agents? They want like a 20% profit or something like that, some outrageous number. Yeah. I often wonder if in times like this, they're still able to maintain uh, paying the drivers and still maintaining that 20% profit at those large brokerages like they were before. You know, I wonder if you had any insight into that. Um, I think it just so, – well, uh we we've had a few that have that have definitely put out some data lately uh that shows they're still somewhat doing pretty well uh, as far as uh as far as profitability wise as far as you know what they've generated um but i think you know those companies they're such a large footprint that they will you know they will it's uh it's like trying to say for an example and not you know no no pun intended or anything like that but just trying to you know utilize an example it's like trying to say we're going to get rid of swift you're really not going to be able to get rid of Swift. You know, they're a big player. And so when you look at companies like TKO and C.H. Robinson and those massive players like that, you know, they've been in the game for so long. Uh, their, 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 market, their, their uh, footprint is so well implanted in this industry, and they've been around, and everybody knows who they are. I mean, everybody, you know, when they hear the name C.H. Robinson or TKO or whatever, because they know who those guys are. Um, and so, yes, I'm sure they still have some accounts that are producing those type of profit margins. I don't believe that they have accounts that are producing those type of profit margins like they used to at one point in time. I'm sure they probably had more accounts, uh, and, and more frequently they were probably hitting those profit margins. Uh, and but I don't, I, I don't believe that they are hitting those same profit margins frequently like they used to at one point in time. I'm sure it slowed down a lot. Again, customers are going back and looking at their cost overall, making changes where they possibly can. They know that at this point, this is a perfect time where they can kind of kick back a little bit on what it is that they're spending, and they know that as long as they're somewhat reasonable, even by lower the prices a little bit, but as long as even if they're on the lower end of that market, if they got to pay just a tad more, they're okay with it. But the fact of the matter is that it's still keeping them on the lower end of the market, so they're still coming out ahead as far as what they were used to pay for those same exact services before. So I would, I would, I would definitely say that those larger, larger, you know, brokerages and stuff like that are not seeing those as much are not seeing those profit margins as much and as frequently as they once were at one point in time. Right on. Now, I know, like, I've known you since the beginning of trucking when you first came out of the Army, and mm -hmm. uh, I watched you go through the entire industry, you know, company driver, lease driver, owner-operator, broker, the whole nine yards. If you were an owner-operator at this exact moment right now, what would you do different to prepare yourself knowing what you know from the brokerage aspect and seeing the numbers you see every day on the computer when you're when you're booking these loads? What would you do to prepare yourself to make it through whatever's about to come? Um, my first thing, to be honest with you, uh, and for some folks, they may be able to do it a lot more than others. Some folks have probably already done it, to be honest with you, and if they have, they're ahead of the game. Um, mm -hmm. My first thing is cost. Um, so if I was, if I was, you know, if I if I was going back out to be an owner operator today, uh, the first thing that I would look at is what is going to be my overall cost. I'm not worried about how I look going down the road, so to speak. Now, with that mean, with that saying, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be going down the road with some truck that I piece together with some tape everywhere. No, <laughs> you know, I need I need <laughs> I need to make sure that I have a truck that is dependable and that I can count on because at the end of the day, that's what's producing my money. But in the same token, with that said. That doesn't necessarily mean that I need to go to a dealership or one of these auctions out here or anything like that and buy the most beautiful truck that there is on the lot and pay $180,000, $200,000 for it. That is, this is not the market to go be doing, to, to, to want to go out there and do any of those type of purchases at all. Um, right. As a matter of fact, in anything, you want to be as conservative as possible in this type of market. 
And because everything in logistics, especially from an owner operator aspect of it, brokerage, customer, wherever you're at, it's all a cycle. It's all a cycle. You have your highs and lows. And, you know, we had our highs for sure. You know, the carriers had their highs uh, for the last few years. Uh, they've done great. They've made some great money without a doubt while they've been out there. Um, I just hope that they were very smart to save a lot of that money. And for the folks that did save that money and have kept their cost in, uh, you know, within, within, you know, within reason and um, have kept it at a low and have made their changes and they're, you know, they're definitely looking at it from a profitability aspect of it, uh, I'm sure that they'll be okay. They're, they're probably doing all right. They'll be okay. Yeah, okay, they're not producing the kind of money that they might have been producing, you know, a year ago, whatever the case may be, or even six months ago, but they're still okay. They're living. They're still profitable. Um, so that would be the first thing I would do, my cost. Keep the cost within, you know, within reason as much as possible. Keep that cost as low as possible. Um, fuel and all that. And then, yep, fuel and all that stuff and the other. Another thing, understanding our cost per mile is is massive. A matter of fact, for the folks out there that don't understand or even know what their cost per mile is, there is no way they can begin to truly understand what it is that they need to do and how to go about it and being able to run and maintain a profitable business if they don't even know what their cost to, to operate that business is. Mm -hmm. So, and that, and that again comes back to your overall cost. That comes again back to keeping, being conservative. Conserve, right. The more conservative you are, the lower your cost is, the lower your cost is, from uh, as far as operating wise, the more flexibility you have as a business and are able to go do what it is that you want to do or how you want to go about it and still remain being profitable. That's the key. Yeah, and, um, and cost per mile kind of fluctuates. So I always tell people it's your average cost per mile, you know, because obviously if you got a heavier load or a lighter load, that's going to affect your fuel. Where where you're at in the country is going to affect your fuel. Uh, yep. Taxes are a little yep. different depending on where you're at in the country. Yeah. But you can get an average. And if you, if you graph it out, you can get an average, and that, that tells you a lot, you know. So that's Correct. that's usually yep. what I try to tell people is get your average cost per mile. But I am surprised at how many people don't have any idea at all it's, it's, what, their, it's what a lot. their average cost is, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I'm also surprised, like, when I talk to you, and drivers will call in, and they're just shooting a number out there. They have no idea oh. what that lane's paying. They're just yeah. shooting a number out there. How many different sources do you use when you're coming up with a rate for a lane, when you're bidding on a lane to a customer? Uh, at the moment, I'll be honest with you, I use one, two, three, four. Depending on the actual lane that I'm going through and how much time I have to get a, a rate back to a customer, um, between four to five different sources. I'm, you know, I'm putting down, I'm compiling, putting that data together. I'm making sure that I'm really getting the, the picture of what it is that I'm dealing with as far as how many trucks are in the area compared to how many loads are, are, are on the board. Um, and that starts, giving them, that starts giving me somewhat of a, of a picture of what it is that I'm going to deal with as far as market-wise. Um, you know, those are, those are probably the biggest things that I look at is how many loads are there posted compared to how many trucks. I know that those are not absolute numbers. That's just an estimate just to give you somewhat of a picture of what it is you're going to deal with so you start positioning on where you've got to be at when you're putting those rates together. Um, you know, me personally, I look more for the range when I'm looking at a particular lane. I look for, you know, I'm looking for the ranges of uh, what the average cost is that, you know, the lanes have been moving for, uh, you know, for whether it be for today, the last seven days, so on and so forth. And then I put that all into, you know, into, uh, all into perspective to come up with the overall rate. Sometimes, you know, for, I'll be honest with you, about 98% of the time, 99% of the time, I'm, I'm practically right on there. I'm practically right on there. Um, you know, I'm not going to go necessarily into the details, breaking down one by one how I do it, uh, but I'm I'm pretty darn close. I mean, I, I tell you what, I'm very confident. I had a customer, I had a prospect, remember, I had a prospect about two weeks ago. He actually sent me some lanes from Ohio to Florida. They were one pick, one drop, refrigerated, um, uh, going to, to your larger distribution centers. And uh, I gave him very confident you know, rates, Florida inbound. Um, I knew for sure that they were, they were very concrete rates. And obviously I was uh, attempting to get the customer. So I wasn't really trying to hit them upside the head as far as profitability wise. I was really just making sure that I had more than enough money to, uh, to make sure that I, got, I was able to get a truck and get the service completed on it. Mm -hmm. The reality was the, the, the prospect came back and told me that he's roughly paying about 800 to a thousand dollars less than my rates were. Uh, at that point, I'll be honest with you, with everything that I was seeing 
Now, off of all five data, off of all five different sources, I knew that that was completely impossible. There is no way with today's day in prices and fuel and so on and so forth that anyone's paying $800 to $1,000 voluntarily less on Florida inbound freight. Yeah, he was trying to get a lower rate. He was trying to get, and, and you have that. You know, you're going to run into that. A lot of times, you know, they may be comfortable with who it is that they work with already. They don't really have much of a need to have to bring anybody else in. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll kind of fish you off, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you want something? So they'll give you a few lanes for you to uh, to make you somewhat feel comfortable and really make you believe, I guess, that you may somewhat have an opportunity, a chance there. Uh, but the reality is, is, look, I always go based off of I just give the rates. I don't worry about what it is that they – I mean, I do worry about what they want, but I don't worry about what they want rate-wise. I go through, I look at everything, um, and I see what the data says, and then I take all that in consideration, and I come up with a very, very, very good, you know, uh, great rate, and I send it over to them. Um, you know, yes, I got to make a little bit of money, but when I mean a little bit of money, I'm not talking about I got to make five, six hundred, eight hundred dollars per load. No, that's not, you know, I got to, it's got to be reasonable, you know what I'm saying? But I'm also not going to sit here and, and, and take on that kind of risk and all that stuff in the other for only 50 bucks. You know, these folks out here that think that, oh, you know, brokers should only make 50 bucks on a load and that's it. That, that's that's ridiculous. You know, the brokers have a cost. They have a liability. Uh, great example. I have a, a claim right now uh, that, you know, I had a, a carrier do for me back in. He did a load for me back in February and uh, he messed up. He completely, uh, you know, went out there and mechanically, you know, he changed the, the refrigerated temp, the reefer temp and all that stuff in the other. He ended up freezing the product. So, I mean, it was a complete loss of a, a trailer load of product. And then he did. He dipped and uh, didn't pay the bill. The insurance obviously did not cover it because it was driver error. And uh, so, guess who gets stuck with that bill? The broker does. I got, oh, wow. You know, now it's now now it's uh you know just shy of twenty three thousand dollars that we have to go back and uh, as a broker we got to afford out and, and and it's a loss. And so those right, are the that chances comes out of your take. pocket. Yeah, it comes out of my pocket exactly. And so those are liabilities. Those are those are things that you take. And yes, there's there's carriers out there that do exactly that. Um, unfortunately, it is what it is. Um, but you just, you know, you got to roll with it. So there's there's liabilities and everything in, 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 on that aspect of it. So, but yeah, that's that, I utilize four to five different sources. That's how I come up with my rates. I give it to them, um, and then we we'll kind of go from there. If I, they tell me I'm, a, you know, ridiculously high like that one that told me I was eight hundred to a thousand dollars, I I just I said, hey, you know, thanks for the thanks for your time uh, and for the opportunity to be able to bid these lanes. Uh, the reality is, I, I we're, we're just too far off, and I realized just that I'm I wouldn't be much of an asset for you. At those, there's just no way I can touch those prices, and I said I just moved on. So, right, right. Well, I completely understand that. And uh, for some of the drivers out there that wonder, um, Mr. Rivera is still he, he's he's a broker, but he has family that drives trucks. His dad drives, his uncle, mm -hmm. your uncle Wilson's still driving, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's connected on both ends. I know even when you were at one company. You had a little bit of problem because the company felt you're a little bit too generous with the drivers. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. because you are a former driver, so you understand yep. where most brokers are not former drivers. They Correct. have no idea what a driver is going through or what is going on out there. But in that same aspect, you also understand when a driver is BSing you because you drove and you have family to drive. Right. So you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's not hard for you to tell when the driver is lying to you. Which gets me to another point. I know a lot of owner operators gripe about when brokers want them to download these tracking apps or whatever on their mm -hmm. phones while they're running the load. Uh, can you go into that a little bit, explain the purpose of it and um, why it's nothing to worry about, what you use it for? I know it prevents you from calling them 10 times a day. You know, yeah. so <laughs> kind of go into that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, in today's day and age, technology, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all going to admit, you know, it's, it's easy for all of us to admit that on a daily basis from one day to the next, techno we're relying on technology more and more and more. Um, when it comes to, you know, downloading those tracking devices like Macro Point, Trucker Tools, so on, you know, Paul Kais is another one, you know, all those different ones that are out there. Uh, for what I use it for, I'm not going to specific. I, I do know there's some brokers out there that will tell a carrier they got to download this and want them to download and to keep activate and then turn around and call them 15 million times a day, like if they had nothing else better to do. <laughs> Look, right. that's frustrating when I hear that. Because as being a former driver, I, I have a few words for you if you want me to download this tracking device and they want to call me 15 million times a day. Right. 
So I understand that aspect of it. For me personally, though, as as being a broker myself, I'm you know me, I'm a one man team. I don't have you know an office with ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty people working for me. Um, so I have to my 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 aspect as a one man team. I'm, I'm communicating with the customers. I'm providing the quotes. I'm finding the trucks. I'm making sure that I'm on top of it and trying to minimize and hopefully have little to no issues with these loads with back and forth with the drivers as far as communication wise. You know, uh, you know, both at the pickup and deliveries. I'm practically doing it from from A to Z and then some. Mm -hmm. So, time is an essence to me. The more that I, the more that I, the more time I spend doing this, the reality is takes away from everything else that I have to do. And I'm still only one person at the end of the day. So when I'm dealing with carriers, and I may have, you know, for an example, eight, ten, twelve trucks on the road at any given time, and included included in that whole aspect of it, I have some that are delivering others that are scheduled to pick up today, you have the whole ordeal going in front of you. I don't have time to sit there and call every single one of those carriers multiple times to make sure they're okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. First of all, now, it's not necessarily frustrating for me because I would just take it up as this part of doing my job, but the second thing is that it's frustrating on, it is frustrating on me in the aspect when I'm calling carriers and they're sleeping and I'm waking them up. That's a safety issue. I don't want to be waking up carriers when they're sleeping. I didn't, I didn't care, you know, I didn't care for being, I, I, I didn't want to be woken up when I was sleeping and on my 10 hour break. I, I'm, you're a driver, you don't, you know, nobody loves to be woken up that many times. So by me placing, like right now I have trucks on the road. They're on macro point. Every single one of them is on macro point. I can hop online, I know exactly where they're at right now as we speak. But, um, you know, that's what keeps away from me being able to update because there's a lot of things that go on behind the, behind the you know, behind the, the curtain, so to speak, that a lot of carriers don't see and a lot of, you know, people in general don't see. You have to still update those customers. Those customers want to know where their, freight, their freight's at, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do as a broker, or even as a carrier for that matter, because it happens, is a customer calls you for an update, and you tell them you can't get in touch with the truck or you don't have an update for them. That oh, is wow. so yeah. unprofessional. <laughs> that is so, that, that to me just tells me that, Okay, you don't really know what you're doing. You're not on top of your business the, the way you should be. And so by having that point, and there are customers out there that want to know where the hell their truck's at at 9 o'clock at night. That last thing I want to do is call driver at 9 o'clock at night. Right. I want to be able to just look at the macro point and say, yeah, he's here, blah, blah, blah. He's this many miles away. He's good to go for delivery. Boom, there you go. See, I was able to do that, and you as a driver, don't even, we're not even aware of it because that's what you're on macro point for. I don't have to bother you with that. Right. So it makes life much easier on that. Another thing is I have to send updates over by nine, ten o'clock in the morning, whatever the case may be. A lot of times, you know, as a broker, you got to send updates over, let customers know of any issues, if any, you know, start working on on problem solving, uh, of you know, aspects of it and instituting solutions where you can to to get those you know issues taken care of. And so part of that is to send updates over. The last thing I want to do is come in at nine o'clock in the morning and have to call everybody including that driver that just shut down 30 minutes ago because he drove overnight to get an update <laughs> and make sure he's right. good. I shouldn't have well, to I do that. You know, I, you know so. I, I never had to download any of that back whenever I was doing it. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember if you did when we were both working for that a guy out of uh, Oklahoma or not. But I did a few times. It, it was still new back then, but I did a few times. But I remember him calling me three, four times a day. Mm -hmm. Where are you at? Yeah. What's your update? Well, I'm 200 miles from where I was at the last time you talked to me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I used to, I, I even used to get frustrated with him. I used to tell him, well, I have to pull over every time you call me. So every time you call me, that means I get 30, 40, 50 minutes, whatever, behind every time you yeah, ring my phone, you know? So quit ringing my phone, <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't matter. They would call three or four times a day. I hated yeah. it. Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> yeah, I, I I absolutely hated it. And the macro point to me, I know even like now I've gone back to company. As you know, I've been working company a few years, and mm -hmm. we run these computers. We're tracked everywhere we go. They know within a yep. few hundred feet of where their trucks at at any given time, all the time, twenty four seven. Even when I'm off, they can tell you right where it's parked. Oh yeah. And uh, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. It, it's better to me. It's better than them calling me. You know, you, you've known me 12, 13 years. You know, I'm not the most social person in the world. Nah. So, <laughs> you know, 
I mean, yeah. I, you know, I trained you when you were driving. You rode with me for six weeks. You, you, you know that. Mm-hmm. So yep. them calling me three or four times a day, you know, it wouldn't take too many times before I start getting a little out of line with them. You know, and oh, yeah. our conversations don't get real friendly. <laughs> so it, it doesn't bother me, but I know some owner operators do get upset being tracked. That, uh, it's Big Brother, it's this, it's that, and and I kind of have the same outlook you have. If you if you don't want Big Brother tracking you, get rid of your cell phone because he's already. Yeah, you're gonna have to get rid of everything technology you have because it's all tracking you. <laughs> yep, you're you're gonna have to go live with the Amish out there, drive horse and buggy. Um, yep, and, and and eat corn on on the cob off the. Out of the farm, man. <laughs> if yeah. You're already tracked. You're already tracked. Exactly. It doesn't matter. You're already you know, tracked. So the, the, this uh, macro point and stuff that these brokers are asking you to download just makes their job easier, and it creates less less of them having to wake you up, contact you, so they can update their customers. Exactly. But yep. anyway, can you think of anything else that you'd like to add? Oh. I think I mean there's always so much to talk about in the yeah. industry, you know, from some <laughs> but I want to keep I know, on, on on topic. <laughs> I, I know as soon as I, I close it out I'm gonna think of ten things that that I should add. Oh yeah. You know there's always, I, I wanted to add always to you if there was something you wanted to add add to it or anything like that. I know that this information I know one thing that a lot of drivers are gonna love to hear and I love to hear it myself is the fact that you're looking at these numbers on the other end and you're not seeing a crash per se. You're seeing more of a market correction. Yep. You know, uh, we're still higher than the 2019 rates a little bit. Correct. Which, which is great. You know, 2019 was a bad year for a lot of owner operators. Yeah. There were a lot of small companies that went out of business that year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know there's already, even with this little bit of a drop, there's been quite a bit of a reduction in some of these uh, owner operators that went out and bought their trucks when when the market was great and trucks yeah. were expensive. You know, and they ran their cost up too high. So they couldn't function yep. in a in a lower market. Yeah, but yeah, I good. appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, I, I appreciate the time you take, man. I enjoy our conversations and keeping up with uh, what you see on your side as well. You know, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and hearing some of the crazy stories that some of the drivers, like the guy that froze his product <laughs> and then tried to claim claim the reefer broke. I remember that story. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I saw the pictures, I was like, oh, you know, I, I already see what's going to happen. I kind of already know what's going to happen. I don't wish that it's going to happen, but I kind of yeah. already see it. Yeah, you kind of messed that up, my friend. <laughs> yeah, or or the guys so, that go home, and, but they tell you they broke down, and that's why they're a day late on the load, but they're actually sitting at the house. You know, and, you know, <laughs> and it's sad. It, 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 it's, it's frustrating because that does happen. Legitly, honestly, you know, you've broken down. I I can't tell you how many times I've broken down. Oh God, mm-hmm. uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, it does happen. I mean, you know, these things are you know the tractors and trailers and all that. They're all mechanical, and uh, you know they don't. They just break down. They break down whenever they want. Nobody knows when they're gonna break down. That's it. They just do wherever they break is where they break. And uh, you know, you kind of left with the only other option, which is really to get a fix and, and get back on the road as soon as possible. However that may be. Mm-hmm. And of course, in today's day and age. You know, with the with the labor shortage, the prices up everywhere. You know, a lot of these a lot of these shops, um, you know, they're not getting trucks in and out uh, as fast as they used to at one point in time. Unfortunately, a lot of places it's taken, and you know, it's taken quite some some time, you know, additional time uh, just to get. I mean, for an example, my father the other day he stopped off um, at the petrol up in Kern, uh, in Kenley, North Carolina, up there to get some tires. They told him for two tires, eight hour wait for two tires. Oh wow. Oh wow! <laughs> so, I mean, oh, so wow. when you, you know, when you when you think about that, you know, of course, me being a driver and have been out there at one point in time. Now I sit back and think about stuff like that, and I'm like, man, how is that? How is that effective? How is that? What? How does that affect everything else when you're sitting around waiting eight hours for two tires? Mm-hmm. That throws everything else off. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that not, that could be the difference between and, a carrier delivering on time or not. And we have that worker shortage going on throughout the whole world. I mean, it's affecting oh, warehouses. Yeah. It's affecting yeah. food. It's affecting uh, truck drivers. I mean, it's affecting yeah. our everyday oh. way of life, you know, is mm-hmm. being affected by that yep. shortage, including getting mechanical work done, uh, yeah. even yeah. all the way the down to getting a PM done. Yep. 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 
cost is up, the amount so, of time it takes to get it done due to shortage of workers. I mean, it's you can't get it's, it's certain crazy. supplies as far as parts as fast as possible. Sometimes it's taking you know you used to be able to put in an order and get a part in a day or two normally. Sometimes a week later, seven days later, you're still waiting on that part to come through. That's correct. That's, That's you know, correct. and it's it's unfortunate. It's just you know those are the things that we're dealing with. And as much as we would all love to sit here and say, oh yeah, you know we can correct that, and uh, you know that could be a thing of the past by tomorrow. Because honestly, it would be beneficial to all of us for it to be a thing of the past. To be honest with you, <laughs> realistically, yeah. no, that's still going to be there. <laughs> we just yeah, we're. I think there. we're looking at a couple years to to correct yes. that issue that's been created. But yes. anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and close this thing out, and I'll give you a call yep. back here in a minute. And uh, okay, but I'm gonna get this shut down. I sure appreciate your time, Richard. No and, problem. Uh, yeah. you, you take care, and we'll talk to you in a minute. Yes, sir. Okay, man. Thank you.